Hello, I'm Dr. Charles Bruce, Medical Director of the Mayo Clinic Innovation Exchange and Chief Innovation Officer for Mayo Clinic in Florida. Mayo Clinic's Innovation Exchange is dedicated to convening startups, medical and industry experts, investors, government agencies, non-governmental organizations, all of us joining today so that together we can untangle challenges and accelerate the pathway from brilliant ideas to life-changing products for patients worldwide. Thank you for joining us for today's panel discussion that conv convenes top experts on AI innovation, evaluation, and governance in healthcare. I have the privilege of moderating today's discussion, but before I kick off our conversation and introduce our esteemed panelists, I'd like to share a few updates and address some housekeeping items. This session is being recorded and will be available for all Mayo Clinic employees on our video exchange channel by tomorrow and via other Mayo Clinic streaming public channels after the session. If you have questions for our panelists, please enter them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We'll have time at the end of the session for your questions and answers. Covering such a vast topic in just 75 minutes is no small feat. We'll delve into the dynamic intersection of AI advancement, rigorous evaluation, and effective governance strategies in healthcare. Then our panelists will share detailed insights and best practices for translating AI outcomes into tangible benefits. Given the rapid evolution of this field, please be on the lookout for an email invitation from the Innovation Exchange as we'll convene with experts again for deeper dive discussions on other aspects of AI in healthcare. If you haven't subscribed to the Innovation Exchange email list yet, there is a link in the chat or scan the QR code on the screen or visit innovationexchange.mayoclinic.org. Now I want to introduce our panelists. Today we have the privilege of hearing from Dean Suresh Balu, Associate Dean, Innovation and Partnership at Duke University School of Medicine and Director of the Duke Institute for Health Innovation. Dr. Shauna Overgaard, who leads AI evaluation and global partnership strategy for Mayo Clinic. Dr. Sandeep Reddy, Population Health and Data Science Lead from the Duke Institute for Health Innovation. And David Vidal, the Vice Chair of AI Enablement at Mayo Clinic. Welcome to our panelists. We're looking forward to the valuable insights you're about to share with us. And with that, I'd like to have the panelists one by one introduce themselves briefly so that the attendees understand a little bit about the background, as well as the lens and perspective they will be bringing to this discussion. We'll start off with Suresh. Suresh, you're muted. Hello, everyone. I'm Suresh Balu. Uh, thank you for organizing this uh, incredible uh, discussion uh, and a panel in here. So my role, uh, as you introduced, um, is related to driving health and healthcare innovation here at Duke Health and then scaling them beyond Duke Health as well. On a day-to-day -day basis, we develop new care models and put that in practice here with the team here into Duke Health and then scale it outside. And part and parcel of this is heavy emphasis is in data science and evidence generation using data uh, for AI and ML products within our health system. And we not only develop products uh, and put that into clinical care, we also develop the clinical utility and the economic utility for those type of models and then scale it outside of our Duke health environment into commercial realm as well. Thank you. Thank you, Suresh. Shona. Hello, everyone, and thank you to the co-panelists, um, many of the colleagues from the field. It's such an honor to have you all join us um, through this Mayo Clinic Innovation Exchange. Um, my name is Shauna Overgaard. 
I am um, within the Mayo Clinic. I work on enterprise alignment for AI evaluation and translation. Um, part of my work is on identifying potentially disparate groups across the enterprise and helping us to align um, with one another in order to perform a rigorous scientific evaluation that is um, that expedites innovation into clinical practice. And so for that reason, um, we've engaged some of our panelists today who have similar and complementary um, capabilities and research um, publications in the field. So we're bringing them on with this. Some of my work um, in the past has also been in um, a rural area doing um, directing a healthcare analytics program. And so um, while I don't have much opportunity to speak on that, I do think it's a very important aspect of the work that we're doing, um, especially thinking about um, the resources we have available at um, in areas such as the Mayo Clinic and, and others. Um, I work on the steering committee for the Coalition for Health AI. Um, which is an organization that brings um, multiple groups in industry, government, um, academia together to try to develop um, some of those standardized guidelines, um, work to support our Health AI partnership as well, um, and who are doing similar work, but very much at the point of care. Um, and I see incredible value there. Um, and then finally, I work at the National Academy of Medicine um, and with Mark and Suresh, um, we have a subcommittee um, for the AICC, AI Code of Conduct um, work, and I co-chair the American Medical Informatics Association um, AI Showcase. So all of this with the lens and hope to bring toward a collaborative effort so that we can align on what we consider to be best practices to um, make sure that our patients are at the center of our work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Obergaard. Uh, Sandeep. Thanks, Charles. I'm really glad to be part of this panel. I'm the chair of the Center for Advancement of Translation AI in Medicine. I'm also the director of the MBA Healthcare Management Program at the Deakin School of Medicine. Outside these two roles, I also have a medical background. I'm also an entrepreneur and I've contributed to AI policy internationally and nationally. So from that perspective, I, 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 bring, a, I bring a unique perspective of being involved in AI from development to deployment, and I hope to bring some of that experiences in the panel discussion today. Thank you very much, Sandeep. Mark. So hi, everybody. My name is Mark Sendak, and I work with Suresh Balu at the Duke Institute for Health Innovation. My, my path to where I am got me through a math degree, medical degree, and health policy master's kind of fell into product development as I was doing my clinical medical school. Um, I have had the privilege of working on dozens of projects, building new products and services that we've implemented within Duke to solve clinical problems within Duke. That's the primary hat that I wear is doing internal innovation. And then some of the other experiences that I'll draw upon, one of them is through our experience building products and validating those products within Duke, we've been fortunate to create academic and commercial partnerships to now take those technologies and implement them and validate them in other settings. So we do have some experience testing AI products in other institutions. And then the third perspective is from Health AI Partnership, where I have the privilege of working with David Vidal and Suresh on the Leadership Council and with 20 plus healthcare delivery organizations in the US where we spend a lot of time convening, surfacing and disseminating best practices. So it's a pleasure to be here. We, I, I can speak from experience that there's many of the best people in the field to, to learn from and excited to be able to contribute. Thank you very much, Dr. Sendek. I agree. <laughs> and last but not least, David. Hi, everybody. Really great pleasure to be here and, and, and be among the, these panelists. Um, David Vidal, I'm the Vice Chair for AI Enablement at Mayo Clinic, and um, I'm a lawyer, which might be a little bit different than, the, than some people on this panel. Um, and I started out my career in startup. So actually, I went right out of law school into working in a software as a medical device startup. And I was primarily responsible for quality and regulation of this software as a medical device product. And eventually, I was the general counsel of this startup. 
Um, but we successfully navigated over the course of a few years um, uh, FDA clearance, FDA authorization for this product that was detecting diabetic retinopathy at the front lines of care. So we were really transforming care, the way care was conducted through AI. Um, and it was a really interesting time to be navigating that um, with the FDA and kind of co-learning. Um, and then about three and a half years ago, I came here to Mayo Clinic with the intent of kind of taking that, that in-depth knowledge for one product and trying to apply it broadly across many products uh, at Mayo Clinic. And so I lead this, this AI enablement team, which is an amazing team of engineers, uh, quality experts, regulatory experts, um, educational experts and so forth that um, are really trying to help all of the sort of uh, federated innovation efforts around Mayo Clinic to align to um, best practices, policies, regulations, uh, and really uh, focus on translation of the innovation that we build at Mayo Clinic and, and realize that value in clinical practice. Pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, David. So as you can see, uh, attendees, this is really an incredible uh, panel that that Dr. Overgaard has been able to uh, source based on, on, on uh, obviously her, her very strong network uh, that she has built uh, in her role uh, at Mayo Clinic. So I'm going to set the stage a little. Um, Humane, uh, startup, got a lot of funding, $250 million, uh, come up with an AI pin. Um, maybe, uh, Sandeep, do you want to tell us a little bit about this and why is it in the news this week? Certainly. A few weeks ago, there, or a few months ago, there was this hype around AI-enabled a device that you could sort of attached to your uh, shirt or to your address, and then it will be able to bring all the features that you have in a mobile phone. So the intention was to take you away from using or a mobile phone or focusing on your mobile screen and giving that portability to AI devices. So because of that, there was a lot of attention paid to it. And once it got released, uh, there was a lot of uh, criticism about it. In fact, one of the famous YouTuber uh, reviewers called it as the worst product he ever reviewed. So it just goes to show that uh, there's a lot of hype around AI and probably sets the premise for the uh, panel discussion today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sandeep. And and then furthermore, I had, I, I had the good fortune of being at a cocktail reception this week. Uh, and I had someone pitch me an idea, and they were very excited. It was an AI approach to uh, solving problems for me as a physician uh, in an effort to try and limit the number of patients that I need to interact with asking for mundane, asking mundane questions. And although that sounded relatively nice, and he explained that this was an AI-enabled uh, platform, he then went on thinking that he was on a winning streak to uh, tell me that, and in fact, you know, Dr. Bruce, you don't even need to worry. The patients won't even know that they're interacting with, with, with AI. They'll think it's you because we clone your voice. And I thought, what part about this is a good thing? So I think with that, um, you know, this is such a big topic. Um, there is so much activity. There are so many different lenses and perspectives that we can view all this activity from that I felt that maybe an approach was to look at the Mayo Clinic three shields of research, education, and clinical practice, and then maybe add three and four, a fourth and fifth lens through an administrator leader, as well as the perspective of a startup founder entrepreneur. And so I've asked each of the panelists just to sort of bear in mind as they, as they bring their comments that they, they have a certain persona that they'll be addressing in our audience. So with that, I'd like to maybe start off with the first question. And this question is for Mark. How would you define effective AI translation? Thank you for the question. And um, yes, we'll try to I'll try to mostly talk about successes, but where possible, I'll, I'll bring in some, some failed experiences with technology as well. So for this question, one of the first things I, I tried to do was step back and just look at, so Suresh and I, the team, we, we 
help lead here at Duke, we've been running an innovation competition for over 10 years now. So we've seen somewhere between 600 and 700 applications come through for use cases to build and implement something new. And so I'll give some categories that I've seen over the years of different types of success. So obviously the first one is where you're able to show some improvement in a clinical outcome. And this is typically like a patient-centered outcome, something like mortality, something like an acute care complication, a lower limb amputation. So for this, We've done a lot of work around diagnosis of acute care conditions. Probably the most prominent is sepsis, where we're trying to identify sepsis. And while there's an operational outcome related to quality of care bundle compliance, we also are interested and in, in to show reductions in mortality and risk-adjusted mortality for this medical condition. So, so that's one category where you're really trying to move the needle on, on clinical outcomes. The other category is things related to access to care. So being at a place like Duke, we have a lot of expertise, but the demand for that expertise is much greater than our supply. So we've done projects at the interface of specialist, generalist, kind of referrals. So um, these I all put under the category of e-consults. So if we can run algorithms to identify high-risk patients and have a specialist send recommendations to a primary care doc virtually, that is a way to expand access to specialty expertise through use of AI. Another category is cost savings. And this can be through operational efficiency, reductions in kind of amount of labor required. One of my favorite examples here, and I, I know Suresh will remember this vividly, I, I've never before seen our organizational leaders so vigorously want to invest in having a faculty take out a company. <laughs> so this person was coming presenting their idea for an implementation. And he he left with the advice of you need to go start a company and we'll help you build this company. But it was around prediction of surgical instruments for use in the operating room, where a very large number of instruments are put on these trays and have to be cleaned every day, even though they're never used. And so what this team did is they built this RFID tags for the instruments and sensors in the operating room. That way they could precisely say for a given surgeon, what were the instruments that needed to be put on the tray that were gonna be used in that surgery? So it was a hybrid software hardware, but six figure cost savings, even just from rolling this out in a small number of ORs. The, the last one is um, a little bit different, but I, I put it in a category called allocating scarce resources. And so this is when you have an operating room, an ICU bed, a mechanical ventilator, doing some type of triaging to identify what level of risk is most appropriate for that resource. And it could be one example we've done a lot of work in is um, preparing patients for optimal outcomes from surgery. So if we have time to delay surgery, to do more preoperative interventions, or identify patients where surgery likely isn't the best path for care. So those are all kind of different examples of what a successful AI implementation can look like. Thank you, Mark. Suresh, any thoughts? The... Uh, most important piece of translating is primarily to bridge the gap between discovery, AI-based solution discovery, and the real-world patient benefits. I think that's the piece that we are explaining in detail. So if you were to look at it, part of the pieces would be to develop the next generation of folks who can really drive, how do we educate the workforce in terms of developing the translational capabilities required in terms of understanding what AI is capable of and also what are the limitations. I think knowing the limitations is an important piece and how do we teach that 
as a process of building the chasm. We can talk about building models and products and putting into practice. It's about making sure that we can teach these concepts as well. So in that regard, I think uh, we've been engaging students, residents and fellows as well as a part of these activities. And that's going to be an important piece uh, of translating these type of evidences into real patient benefits. And um, one of the strategies that we have certainly adopted in terms of really doing the translation is to making sure every single step of the way we build in transparency into it so that we can build trust both from the clinical perspective and also when possible and where applicable to patients and learners as well. Yeah, thank you, Suresh. What we're going to do is we'll cover sort of strategies to overcome these barriers uh, later on. I'd like to focus this discussion still on the barriers. And, and I think that Mark has very nicely outlined uh, four categories of, of where there is sort of translational activities. And I think, Suresh, you've pointed out that it's important that folks understand what is suitable for an AI solution and what is not. Um, the rest of the panelists, anything you want to weigh in on this about how best to guide someone about when is it appropriate to even consider uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence as a solution? Well, perhaps I can uh, uh, add some more uh, challenges in terms of translation, Charles. So what we have seen in addition to that mistrust uh, that uh, Suresh and Mark talked about in terms of the stakeholders, there's also the issue with access to data, medical data. We know with machine learning, we need appropriate data. Even with uh, unsupervised learning and with the large language models, you still need some sort of data that can be used to train uh, machine learning models, AI models. The lack of access or limited access is a huge barrier for vendors, developers, and researchers. The other aspect which is important in terms of understanding the uh, lack of translation of AI is the scalability of AI models. And that happens because of lack of validation of uh, AI models. And we'll be talking about what validation means and what's involved in external validation, generalization. But we need to be aware of these barriers because they seem to be universal across uh, geographies and jurisdictions in terms of AI adoption. I could add um, to that as well. And these have been excellent comments. Um, thinking about the AI translation aspect of research to clinical practice. Um, many of our stakeholders are interested now in creating software as a medical device. And that's in part why we have um, David Vidal here Vidal on the call. Um, at Mayo, we have brilliant scientists who are creating AI models, and we know that much as in the time of um, bench to bedside, there's this code to bedside gap that is um, very apparent. We're trying to align the organization so that we can enable our researchers who want to get those things into clinical practice, but to do it in such a way that we work with them on best practices. So for instance, with good machine learning um, practices or our data scientists um, perform rigorous scientific evaluation as it is. Can we sit on top of that some of the recommendations for um, quality and um, FDA submission? So, Shona, what I, I, I want to just drill down a little bit. What are the consequences of data access, of poor data access? What are the consequences of poor data? What are the consequences of not knowing what you don't know? How do you know the data that you're not getting? Um, David, do you want to maybe address those questions? Yeah, certainly. And, and maybe a little solutioning around it as well, um, which is to identify a barrier. So I think one of the barriers is, is data access. Um, but we also know that the lack of appropriate data access or lack of representation in your training data does lead to significant harm, significant consequences. Um, so one thing we think a lot about is, is a risk-based approach and making sure that we identify what are the potential harms that could occur as we build this algorithm, as we build this AI, and then how do we mitigate those harms? So with respect to data and, and, and your question, we, we know that there's a potential harm of bias for an algorithm if we don't have appropriate data. So how do we mitigate that? Well, we do a, a, an audit. We do a data audit. We actually make sure that our data sample is representative of the intended population that, that we want to serve. And we actually build that into our product development process. So we have identification in our product development process that we've accounted for that risk. But we do that over and over and over, right? Identify risk, mitigate, identify risk, mitigate. And we end up with this really wonderful file of all the risks that we've identified and mitigated um, before we go into deployment. 
uh, and that really augments the translation process for us. In, 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 Charles, just one thing to chime in is, I, I often tell people the first five years of doing this work, I literally was just cleaning data and getting really good at cleaning data. <laughs> and that actually like was foundational to being able to do what we do now with more efficiently building and implementing AI models. But um, there is, I, I can confidently say it, I have never worked on a project where we didn't find things in the data that were problems that no one was aware of in our system. That um, I think it's like the the level, and I maybe this is my bias, but um, because when you're building these products, so much of the quality of the product relates to the quality of the data from which it's derived. I feel like the level of investment, because these aren't processes that exist. Health systems don't exist to create really great quality data to train machine learning. Like that's not why the data is generated. So, I mean, it's, I don't know. It's just one area where I think we have to be investing in bringing together the clinicians who know the workflows and the folks who know the data systems to do that resolution. Yeah, that's a very important point. Uh, we actually have a question here. We have a lot of questions coming from the audience. Uh, I'm going to maybe just quickly um, address one of them. What are the challenges around accessing large data sets um, to build and test AR models for diagnostic models? At one time, this was a limitation slowing down development of AR models. How are your organizations dealing with this? Perhaps I can uh, answer some of it, uh, Charles. Um, one of the big challenges in terms of accessing data, as Mark uh, mentioned, is the lack of appropriate data. Even when we get data, we know that healthcare sector produces the highest amount of data of all the various industries or various organizations we have, but it's the access of access to appropriate data. The second challenge that we have is uh, medical institutions are obviously um, careful in providing access to the data because they're worried about patient privacy. And the third challenge in terms of uh, being able to utilize the data is that you, when you look at uh, current models, uh, large language models, um, most of them are um, uh, open source models. That's fine. You can use them to uh, fine tune those models for the specific domain. But when you're looking at uh, proprietary models, the uh, inability to change the weights and uh, fine tune those models is gonna be a challenge. So I have a question then is, how do you, is there an issue with regard to when is the solution fixed? When do you continue to inform that based on ongoing data acquisition? And then how do you compare one solution with another? How do you determine which one is either more effective or the same? Also, how do you determine whether you should actually invest in working on developing another model if one exists and you're just not aware of it? Those are uh, very, very good questions and uh, require complex answers in many ways. Uh, I think the first step is if you one is what well, I'm going to address the comparison piece, right? Uh, in terms of comparison, um, the question is, do we have the same outcome very clearly defined? It all starts with outcome definition. When you build a model, that's number one. Are we talking about just the model? AI-based model or AI-based model plus the workflow, because the workflow is an important piece which actually translates the action into a result that we are interested in. So at least in terms of evaluation, we need to be evaluating it for the actual outcome. So which means that it has to be model plus the final set of results. That's how we've been approaching it. And that's what we would recommend that people approach as well. That's number one. Number two, uh, in terms of the actual comparative evaluation, we need to have an evaluation data set that is solidified 
and set up. That's number one. And then we compare these two models, put it into practice. One is a theoretical piece, which is retrospective validation, but certainly there has to be a silent validation where you don't take any actions and see how well the model performs. And third, the next step is to have some sort of uh, study, which is well-designed study. Maybe it is randomized or not randomized. There are specific ways by which we develop protocols where we study which model is effective in terms of producing the actual outcome that is of interest and then uh, evaluate them. The most important piece in all these is having some level of safety in, built into every step of evaluation because we're going to be evaluating with live data. That's number one. And then we need monitoring and infrastructure in place to make sure that we can constantly monitor the outcomes as well. So uh, with that, I'll probably ask others to comment as well. I'd love to add on to that with maybe a, a story in my in my background, which is when I first got to the to the startup we were at, we had we had an algorithm when I arrived, and we actually had already gone to the FDA and 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 said, hey, we have this algorithm, it, it, the inputs. If you look at the inputs and then you look at the outputs, it's as good as a as a physician. We should get approval, and and we got flat out rejected, and the reason for that is they said this is not just an algorithm, right? This is not just inputs and outputs. This is a system. This is this is a change to an ecosystem. And they said, essentially, look at look at the FDA guideline, look at the processes that, that we expect you to go through, follow those, which we did do. And in hindsight, I realized that that going through this process of, of identifying, OK, what's the specific use case? What's the setting in which we intend to deploy? What are the potential risks that we are going to face when we deploy in that setting, That given that it's different than the current standard of care? How do we mitigate those risks? How do we train our users to capture the images that are input into the algorithm. That's not our algorithm, but we got to get the right images in there. How do we validate that we've done that effectively? And then how do we make sure that we have change management and, and processes to monitor and update that algorithm over time? That's that's what took between the time that we first submitted and got rejected to the time that we got approval was building out a system, an ecosystem, a, a change to an entire workflow, not just an input and an output. And that process, you know, that that's, that's essentially what we're now building out is what what did that look like? What are the what are the regulators and the standards expecting us to go through and provide in terms of evidence that this is going to be safe, effective, and ethical once translated into a clinical workflow? And and we use that as sort of our our guideline in in in, in translating any any algorithms internally. David, I think you've you've hit the nail on the head there, and I think this is evolving nicely. Shauna, how do we educate people? with regard to understanding these barriers, particularly with regard to the integration into clinical workflow, understanding that there may be regulatory challenges and, and complications, mm -hmm. um, understanding how to, how to determine whether or not the data integrity is satisfactory and whether you are actually getting the data from the right sources. Mm -hmm. yeah. How do we go about educating people? Yeah, and I'd, I think I'd first like to take it from the perspective of a rural healthcare facility, um, just starting off with the foundational components. I personally feel that we need more support for um, rural healthcare systems in order to build up their data infrastructure. And I think that we also have a moral imperative as the larger um, hospital systems that um, are creating much, much of these algorithms to be able to translate into clinical settings. So whether that means um, packaging them in such a way, providing educational materials in such a way. Um, so to your question, um, as an anecdote, when I first came to um, Lake Region Healthcare in um, Northwestern Minnesota, um, directing a healthcare analytics program, I came out of the gates, um, out of grad school, just burning, you know, ready to create machine learning models and um, change the course of um, the system. Um, I worked very hard to create an opioid um, tapering algorithm, which was relatively effective. However, the primary issue was gaining access to the data, simply identifying within the tables where the values are that we would want to extract over time, let alone running any sort of um, computations um, on them. Also, being able to educate the staff as to um, why this may be helpful, what to look out for when we're talking about leveraging AI in clinical settings, not just in these large institutions, but in smaller ones as well. We sometimes um, face skepticism, and I think that's rightfully so. Um, in fact, we know that 
there's been discussion about AI translation being so slow in healthcare, but in, you know, fintech, it goes quickly in um, other institutions, it might, uh, other domains, it might go more quickly. But I think that the the risk um, of patient harm is so great that I actually commend our health systems for taking our time to really think through many of these problems and um, for, toward a workable solution. I think the education component is that um, all, all members of healthcare institutions need to understand that foundationally, um, models are simply the data that represent them. Um, they represent the bias, the human bias that we have. Um, I think it's been incredible that we are, how we've been able to um, learn from machine learning um, about ourselves and the inherent biases that we have. So I think those are some components to consider. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, you, you, you mentioned a little, you know, we've touched on a little bit of the regulatory challenges. What do you have any examples or of of regulatory challenges that innovators, researchers were not aware of, did not take into account, that then ended up really jeopardizing or or, or, or slowing their work down significantly? I mean, this was one of the things that we were were thinking about coming in today was like, how do these challenges differ across organizations? And something that we've seen firsthand in Health AI Partnership is how different parts of government, not just at the federal government, but now different states, different jurisdictions are moving forward with different goals and objectives. And so there's a lot of confusion from health systems. So I'll, I'll give you the example that one of our sites in Louisiana, they sent a bunch of their IT leadership to go meet with state legislators who are considering a bill to ban the use of AI in clinical care. We have a site in New York that was participating in a public health program that was really aiming to, to remove race as an input to clinical algorithms. We have a site in California where the attorney general sent a letter to the CEO saying, you need to give me information about how you're addressing bias for all of the AI tools that you're using in your, in your health system. So I, I wouldn't say that these are necessarily things that stifle innovation, but they are things that, I mean, we, we used to joke like in medicine, you end up being pulled into lots of other adjacent domains to advocate on behalf of patients. So that, that may mean that you get involved in the school district, the social determinants of health. But I mean, now you literally have health systems saying, hey, you need to go talk to our state legislators because they don't know what they're about to do. So it's just a different part of complexity. Sandeep. Yeah, look, I'm, I'm going to talk from an entrepreneur perspective, uh, Charles. When we look at the uh, large markets like US, UK, and you, and to a degree um, uh, here in Australia, the entities that gatekeep uh, the commercialization or the market entry of AI products, they naturally so have uh, a classification based on the risks associated with AI as a software, as a medical device. So that's completely fine. And I think that's absolutely critical to have. What entrepreneurs have a challenge, especially small to medium enterprises, is the time that it takes to get pre-market clearance or market clearance. But then when you get the clearance, the costs associated with the compliance and also to get that regulatory approval is enormous for any small medium enterprises. And when you think about the risks because of that process, you're basically allowing only the big tech companies to be able to go through that process and introduce products. And that not only uh, stifles innovation, but pretty much uh, allows for the domination of big tech uh, products to uh, be released uh, into the market. I think that's something that uh, regulatory agencies in material of the jurisdiction have to take into consideration. Perhaps there is an ability to subsidize or even uh, provide a streamlined process. FDA is a pioneer in that area. I think uh, uh, rest of the world could look up to FDA, but even the FDA process takes an enormous amount of time 
uh, in terms of being able to obtain that clearance and be uh, uh, follow the compliance. Mark mentioned about, uh, in addition to the FDA, there's the HIPAA compliance that has to be taken into account. There's also the state level regulations that are to be taken into account. So I think there is a, a scope for uh, streamlining the process. Critical points, Sandeep. Uh, David. Yeah, I just wanna, I wanna touch on that. I think that, that it, it, in terms of cost and time, it, it really can be overwhelming to think about going through the FDA process and following all those controls. And I think that's part of the reason why forms like this are really important in coalitions and getting healthcare organizations and startups together to think about how do we optimize these practices? We know FDA is really interested in streamlining practices, especially for software and AI, because you actually can iterate really quickly and that's an advantage for safety, right? To be able to update your data and to, to represent a new population and then quickly update your model to better serve that population, that's an advantage for safety. And FDA recognizes that and really wants to, to streamline and, and make least burdensome these, these regulations. And but, but what we need to do first is like have that common understanding together of how we can streamline, how can we interpret FDA regulations in an optimal way to lead to safety. I also want to touch on, and if I put my administrator hat, like, like from the beginning, thinking about healthcare organization governance, we, we need to make sure that we're not being redundant to the existing traditional governance functions that we have, right? We have our, our privacy, we have legal, we have research with IRB, we have, you know, security frameworks. We, we can't be thinking about AI as so unique and special that we need to reinvent the wheel for all of those different domains. Rather, we need to think about how do we augment each of those domains with AI expertise, you know, so that we can we can make it just a little bit better and then fill in the gaps that are unique to AI. So we get this holistic picture of, you know, within our organization without having to reinvent the wheel or create a whole new brand new framework that just adds on that much more complexity and burden and rigor, which makes, you know, compliance feel even more rigorous. If we optimize what we already have and interpret in a way that's streamlined and least burdensome, I feel like we actually can lower the barrier to entry for these algorithms. I think we can take regulation and make it work for us rather than against us. That's really our primary goal here. Great. Yes, uh, Mark. And so kind of building off David's comments and tying together with Shauna. So a lot of our attention in Health AI Partnership is both about how do we strengthen the internal capabilities of organizations to govern product lifecycle for AI, but then we also are thinking about how do we translate these capabilities into settings that don't have internal expertise and capabilities to be building these solutions in-house. I would say that we have seen movement from regulators in a direction that could stifle market access. And so I would, I'll drop the link here, but I know David and Shauna have written about quality management systems within healthcare delivery organizations, how to leverage existing capabilities for quality management for AI. Something that we are writing with David that will be forthcoming soon is also a response to the final CDS guidance from the FDA which a lot of health systems interpreted that guidance as meaning that if they want to use acute care algorithms in the hospital, they now have to go to FDA and get device clearance for those. So I think we there is a path that can align governance regulation with building those local capabilities to stir innovation and promote innovation and to Sandeep's point, I think one of our concerns is that if we if we don't do that, it we risk further entrenching incumbent players that have existing sales channels, access to data to really be the sole providers of AI. Very excellent. Uh, I think that we, we're touching on some important points. Um, before wrapping up with what I would consider to be the challenges and barriers that 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 researchers innovators experience bringing their ideas to benefit people quickly. You know, we need to have sustainable solutions. We need to have ethical solutions. We touched on that a little bit. Um, there are issues with cybersecurity. Um, there's also issues with uh, patient engagement. Um, we touched on that a little bit. Does anyone want to dig deeper on any of those particular points? And are there any other ones that we haven't covered yet? Shauna. Sure, 
I'd like to speak a little bit to trans um, transparency. So we've heard this um, not only throughout the United States, but also our European Union has been very focused on transparency and many of the elements there. Um, the responsibility, the accountability, when, and David mentioned um, auditing as well. So I think that in typical research, um, we often ex have the expectation that we must report on, say, tripod, there's Decide AI, there's Spirit AI, Consort AI, et cetera. Many of these um, research reporting guidelines can be aligned across the AI life cycle, and many scientists approach um, their work in transparency with that as a guide. So before going to the software as a medical device team with David, I was in more of the translational science area, and didn't, I didn't quite appreciate how much um, regulators or the FDA already calls for a lot of those same um, concepts that researchers are already doing. My concern sometimes is, um, and something we've been speaking to our researchers about is, like, look, you're already doing such incredible work to document and practice good science. How can we enable you to use the tooling and the work that you're already doing to contribute to um, some of the um, FDA submissions, for example? I think, too, that um, giving the autonomy to all of the stakeholders across the AI life cycle to be able to voice their expertise. And so I'm thinking, for instance, our AI ethicists deserve a stronger voice in this space. I think our sociologists also do. There's an incredible socio-technical component of these um, this work, our implementation scientists, our nursing informaticists. I'm scared to leave anyone out now after saying that. But um, everyone, um, you know, we're, we're trained as experts with our very own perspective and unique lens. And I think that now's the, the time to assume that we don't know everything or even anything to some degree and invite others to be able to contribute um, to the effectiveness, to what do you need to know across the life cycle um, that will inform other decisions to be made later? How does all of this work as a network? Um, and a, a mesh um, situation. I'll pass it off to you, Sandeep. I just wanted to raise the need or the premise why we need AI in healthcare. It'll be remiss on our part to talk about the challenges associated with AI in healthcare, but not to talk at in the first instance why we need AI in healthcare. From that point of view, there are significant challenges healthcare systems across the world face in terms of uh, healthcare workforce, chronic disease burden, uh, aging population and uh, medical safety issues. So I think unlike other technologies, AI, because of its ability to uh, augment or automate processes, I think uh, there is certainly a requirement. I just wanted to lay that on the table. So uh, the audience and we are aware that there is definitely a need for AI, uh, considering the challenges uh, healthcare systems, healthcare organizations face. Yeah, Sandeep, I think that's important. And I think Sean has mentioned also just, you know, rural hospitals, but, you know, I, I certainly trained in South Africa. And, and, and one wonders whether this kind of activity is going to sort of deepen the digital divide and, 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 and just the importance of, 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 of keeping a global perspective on, on how the applications of artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, is, is applied very globally, frankly. I think on that front, um, we have done some work between here and uh, a setting in Pakistan, and our experiences are uh, basic capabilities have to be developed in a local setting. And using the data that is available locally, we are, I would say, data rich in many ways. And um, because of the advancements are um, has been a little slow, uh, are significantly slower in certain uh, lower income countries, uh, the data availability also is very different. So we will have to develop capabilities so that models and solutions are tailored to the local environment and then validation has to be done in the local environment. So I think we'll have to really plan for that. And I think uh, we all talk about um, building models which are highly complex with thousands and thousands of input features. I think we need to start looking at parsimonious models, which can be translated to other settings as well. That's part and parcel. 
I want to add one more comment to Shana's piece, which is transparency is absolutely, truly important. And I think we certainly have to be much more transparent with our patients. I, I think that's an engage community that we need to engage because it's about building trust. And uh, not only with the clinical workforce, it also should be with patients. And I think we need to start with uh, showing what is being used at what point in time and how it should be used and engaging them right from the design aspects of solutions would be pretty beneficial as well. I just want to okay. amplify. No, I'm Go sorry. <laughs> I just want to amplify Suresh's point as well. Um, with the transparency with our patients, I think it's time that we come to realize that patients should own their own data. You know, it's it's almost a resource that they have that they should be, I don't want to say compensated, but perhaps let's consider that. Um, how often do we use patient data um, throughout all of this? And then many of our institutions end up making um, quite a bit of money. And so it's how, um, with, in terms of the democratization, giving patients back ownership um, and allowing them to control not only the data that they're given, but also have access to the insights that their data are providing. So I think that at this point, I'd like to uh, pivot, maybe just touch a little bit on a summary. Um, you know, we've been addressing the translation of research in AI to impactful clinical outcomes that are safe, that are ethical, and that are free of all these bad things that we've been trying to avoid. Um, I think it was very nicely outlined that th there are at least four different sort of pillars of how we can approach those based on uh, Dr. Sendak's uh, introductory comments related to clinical outcomes, access to care and triage, uh, cost savings and operational efficiency, and as well as allocation of scarce resources. And some of the challenges that we've identified, and please be sure to make sure I haven't left any out, are principally related to data, data access, data quality, data integrity, and the representativeness of that data. Um, the, in, the integration into clinical workflows. It's no good having a solution that doesn't integrate seamlessly into a clinical workflow. Um, the regulatory and compliance issues uh, as it pertains all along the, the, the chain of development. Educating stakeholders so they're aware of the pitfalls and challenges. Again, ensuring that we actually are thinking about patient engagement and addressing not only patient skepticism, but also healthcare provider skepticism or even using these approaches. Um, and then of course, we've just touched on transparency and the importance of transparency. Anything I left out? I'm sure the audience is yelling at the screen, you forgot this or that. <laughs> well, well, be sure to let us know. Because know. That I'd like to now maybe pivot this now to say, all right, how about solutions? How do we go about solving these problems? How do we help innovators, and remember your personas, how do we help those innovators? Imagine now that you have an innovator in front of you who has got an idea and they want to bring it to benefit people as quickly as possible. What advice do you give them? What are the organizations that you work with or work for that, that are helping address these challenges so that our attendees can have um, practical, practical things to do next? about how they either lead innovation in AI or serve as innovators themselves, or, or certainly serve as educators in this area. Maybe I'll start off with, uh, with Mark. So um, these comments relate to our experience at DHI supporting the external validation of our technologies in other environments. And I'm sure David can probably speak to this from your industry days. One of the things that I've really um, embraced is the idea that you don't scale just AI products, but that you have to scale the services to support their implementation. So we've worked with multiple hospitals in other states in the United States we have had to help them do what Shauna described of like, where in the tens of thousands of tables can they source the data that they need to pull out to run our model? 
So we've actually had to help them do the data mapping. We've had to help them do the data grouping, the data quality assurance. Sometimes we even need to provide compute environments for them to host their data to do an external validation. There's different levels of needing to provide the technical assistance with the coding. So um, it's this is not going to be an easy feat. And it takes resources, personnel, technical infrastructure. I, I'm really excited because with Health AI Partnership, we've been meeting now with FQHC networks that are coming to us eager to participate in the technical assistance program. But I also know that it's going to be a lot of work. It's going to be a lot of help with them. There's going to be things that we can't do. There's going to be opportunities for technology firms to come in and provide some of these services, professional services firms to come in and augment this. So um, I think that at a high level, the capabilities exist across our various organizations. We just have to harness them and augment them with external partnerships to be able to support diverse settings in implementing and adopting AI responsibly. David? I, I wanted to tag on that because that what, what Mark just described is sort of an enablement model, a hub and spoke sort of enablement model nationally. And I would say we, we do the exact same thing internally as well, right? So we have this AI enablement team and our primary function is not to be governance. Our primary function as a team is to just guide all the innovators through the processes, share the capabilities that we've already built over here, build it over here, repeat environments, identify redundancies. You know, this tool, you want to do that, but that's 90% built over here. Why don't we use it over here too? And really build up those capabilities in a way that that, that um, all the individual innovators can advantage. I think that's one of the solutions. That's how, that's one of the ways in which we're stream, streamlining processes. Um, and within that, if we're talking about best practices, I think the second thing I wanted to bring up in terms of solutioning here is to not be afraid of, of the term quality management system. I know there's a lot of fear around that because it feels burdensome, it feels rigorous, but uh, across industries, over decades and decades of, of regulatory sciences, these quality management systems have been proven to, to work, right? Aeronautics, car industry, healthcare, um, and we can take advantage of those principles and apply them for AI. And what quality management system concepts really do is it makes sure that you're scoping correctly to build, to, to actually want to build the right product first before you start, before you invest. Then you actually build the right product and you verify and validate that that's actually the right product. And then you test it in its clinical setting. Those steps, going through those steps, are truly enablement and 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 uh, risk and cost and burden reduction because you actually build what you in intended to build, deploy what you intend to deploy, and it's much easier to manage from that point forward. So we think about quality management system, we think about enablement. Those are two kind of conceptual solutions that we work on internally. Shona. I really like that, obviously, and David and I are completely aligned in that way. Um, I really want to, in terms of the um, education hat, uh, Dr. Bruce, that you've given me for, for part of the session, um, clinical informatics. Um, and so when we think about data quality, we have this group of professionals who are incredibly well-trained in um, um, medical informatics, clinical informatics, et cetera, to be able to identify data quality, to clean data, to create robust um, evaluation processes. These are these are skills um, that they're trained for several years on. I believe that there are also opportunities to bring in our clinicians and to um, marry the ideas and the training concepts there as well. Um, similarly, our researchers, what does rigorous scientific evaluation look like? So my point is that, um, similar to what Mark was saying, that some a lot of these aspects already exist and perhaps they were born for different reasons. But if we can leverage their unique lens and bring that together, um, kind of rising above the noise, if you will, toward a joint mission, um, I think that that's where we can start to create a quality management system that's effective. Thank you, Shauna. Sandeep, what advice would you give the the, the startup entrepreneur? Yeah, so something uh, that's really critical is evaluation. Shauna touched upon it, but I'm talking about not technical evaluation. Uh, as part of developing the machine learning models, there's internal validation. And if uh, some people want to go to the extent, there's external validation. But I'm talking about other aspects like integration into existing healthcare information systems, 
uh, looking at the clinical governance process, patient safety and quality, but also talking about uh, those aspects where you want to dispel the uh, skepticism amongst the stakeholders. And a primary way to do that is to educate people. But if you kind of build it into the development and the deployment aspects of AI models, and rather than wait for the AI model to be deployed into a system and then uncover a lot of issues, you can uh, you know, preempt those issues by building an evaluation model very early on. And that's something I clearly want to emphasize to vendors, developers, that you think of evaluation very early on, but also think about how you're going to educate the end users, both clinicians and the patients as to what are the benefits of the AI, but also what are the limitations around that AI model. So that way you enable adoption of the AI model. Thank you. Suresh, what is, what is your advice? First and foremost is solving the right problem. Uh, if you are a developer, I think we need to start with that. That's number one. And I think in terms of really ensuring success in translation requires a close, close partnership with the clinical team. I think we start with that and that's the second piece. And certainly what Sandeep mentioned in terms of uh, transparency and uh, validation and also making sure uh, that the model is built to support a workflow. Clinical workflow is going to be pretty important. I think those are the aspects that has to be thought through because if you really see a uh, successful translation uh, into clinical practice um, relies heavily on uh, active engagement and acceptance of healthcare providers. I think if that's the use case, I think we need to start with that as a first and foremost piece and then put in the necessary investment needed for uh, making sure that it's doing the right thing in terms of ethics, which means bias and fairness aspects of it and having the infrastructure for monitoring as well. I think thinking through this process from beginning to end will enable the right set of dev the developers to develop the solution that's going to go into a clinical uh, workflow. So I think that's an important aspect to think through. So just quickly, and, and Mark, I'm gonna leave this with you, but I want to open it up for questions and answers. You published, uh, both you and Suresh, pu published an article in Digital Medicine recently on the algorithm journey map. And I was really, I thought that was an incredibly useful paper, particularly the diagram and the pragmatic approach from start to finish. Do you want to maybe just touch at a high level? But I think it's a terrific resource, and maybe we can even put a reference to that uh, to that in the chat. And I see you smiling. I'm, I'm smiling because um, like many things we do, it was we thought it was incredible. It was really hard to publish because we got a lot of negative reviews that said, what is this? Like, this isn't research in my field. It's not research in my field. So, so we um, we work in innovation. So we're always coming up with wild things. But there's there's well there's there's well studied standard design um, methods. So customer journey mapping is a standard approach for human centered design, where you take a customer journey and you map out all of the steps and all of the stakeholders and you even try to identify where are the highs and lows in a journey. So we took inspiration from that as well as process mapping for quality improvement projects where we also spend a lot of time mapping out clinical workflows and stakeholders. So the question we tried to ask was, can we create a journey map for an algorithm? And how an algorithm moves through an organization and what all of the activities are throughout the journey from problem identification all the way through life cycle management. So we, we worked with social scientists to do this. They did 20 interviews with different people and we came up with a very, I see the links here. Um, it was a funny paper because I would recommend to no one to follow the same journey that we went through. And the, the goal is that every organization has its own quirks, its own nuances. 
I'd love to see more. And we, we publish this because we want these types of artifacts out there in the world where more people can map their own journeys and share their pain points. Because we find that a lot of discussion about AI stays at 10,000 feet. And it's hard to take out concrete learnings that you can put into action. So we tried to do something that felt more tangible and would love to see other contributions in this area. So, so thank you for calling that out. Not at all, but I thought it was a very good approach to what I consider to be a really difficult problem that we've been discussing today. David, just very quickly, because I want to make sure that we, we leave some final um, time for, for, for questions from the audience. Yeah, and actually, I, I had my hand up and I left it up because I actually was going to address one of the questions. It's from Juliana. Oh, Do you recommend that founders and developers meet with state and federal regulators before spending too much time building models? This is kind of a lesson learned I had. I, I would actually have the opposite advice. I would say have, it's okay to start simple. It's okay to start with retrospective data and just make sure you're building the thing you actually want. Make sure that it's actually going to address the problem you're trying to solve. Really try to experiment and iterate early on in a safe way, right? Maybe under an IRB, maybe with in, in a way that's not going to have any impact whatsoever on patient care. But first, get to the point where you can build, you, know, you get close enough to knowing that you, that's what you want before you invest too much, too heavily into the translation. We talk a lot about translation and, and, the, and the burden and the rigor, and it is. It's costly. It's time consuming. It requires a lot of controls. Make sure that when you get to that stage, you have pretty much the thing that you want to build first. So I'm just kind of acknowledging that, and one of the lessons learned is make sure you have that early ideation stage to be agile and quick and iterate and make sure it's the thing that, that's gonna, gonna be the, the thing that, that solves your problem before you get too far down the road. Fantastic. So um, the panelists, have a look at the questions in the Q&A and just pick, pick any questions that you feel like you want to answer. Does anyone have one right off the bat? I'll, otherwise I'll ask one quick one. For all, how do you ensure your ideas are going beyond the piloting stage and transposed into sustainable and impactful solutions? Suresh, I want you to answer this one. <laughs> I would say, I think, uh, at least for us, the way we have set up, uh, it is not a pilot. Right from the beginning, we select the problem and scope the problem, and only when this is not just for AI, AI or not AI. It's about developing a solution which clearly addresses the problem, taking into consideration the actual workflow uh, and the end user, bringing them right in front to help design the solution right from the beginning is what is truly needed in terms of having the solution go into a place and then having validate that and show, demonstrate the value first to the end user and who becomes the champion for adoption and scaling internally is how we need to do that. And then certainly put the necessary places in, um, scaling pieces in place so that you can not only scale internally, externally as well. You want a champion, clinical champion, and at some level an evangelist as well on your behalf when you develop the solution. Sandeep, do you have a question that you want to answer? Yeah, there was a question about how you go about establishing a governance uh panel in order to review AI applications. I think you don't need to duplicate or uh, make existing process redundant. You can actually integrate that AI review within existing clinical governance quality safety committees. That's really important to understand. But if you don't have anything, um, there are simple ways in order to ensure that the AI applications you adopt is uh, safe and indeed has the uh, delivers the objectives it intends to. But importantly, within that governance panel, it's really important and critical to have the end users like clinicians and patient uh, representatives on the governance committees. You will be surprised as to how many institutions have governance committees which do not uh, incorporate patient uh, views or do not have patient uh, representatives on the panel. So there are ways about it. Uh, I do uh, encourage people to refer to our paper about governance, uh, which we published a few years ago. Uh, but certainly, I think governance is very critical in terms of translational and adoption of AI. Thank you, Sandeep. Dr. Overgaard? Yeah, I wanted to um, touch on the notion of the letting patient um, 
Ms. Anne Marie Schrader mentioned um, how I had referenced owning patients owning their data. Um, and I completely agree with her statement that um, all the stakeholders need to own the processes in the organism cycles of development. I think that that's essential. So giving people the, again, giving experts the autonomy um, to go about making recommendations. We know that there are societies forming specifically on AI. One example being um, the European Ethics um, Society are, are coming together to try to understand um, how can they be contributing to AI solutions um, in healthcare settings and otherwise? I think that healthcare systems can be very proactive in inviting them to contribute and partnering with existing societies as well. Excellent. So with that, David, I, I'm going to ask just the panelists, we've got three minutes left, and I want to quickly sum up, but I want for all of you just to leave the audience with one key point that you don't want them to forget with regard to translating the most promising AI research into, into impactful clinical solutions. David, what is your most important thing you want the audience to know? Think holistically and multidisciplinary, and especially with a complex organization. Know that every single role in the AI development life cycle and deployment life cycle is equally important, no matter how much contribution they have, and empower each of those individuals throughout the life cycle. Even if they only have a small voice, it's still really, really, really important to empower each of the individuals in the AI life cycle. Fantastic. Sandeep? Uh, don't put the cart before the horse. Uh, devise your AI application around the problem. Don't bring the solution before the problem. So that's very important because you, you'll be surprised as to the number of uh, vendors, developers who develop a solution even before thinking there's a problem that needs to be addressed. Terrific. Definitely speaking to the entrepreneur. Mark? So, so Sandeep already took one of ours. That's great. And then um, I'll add one then. Lean into blurring the line between developer and delivery system. Because I think that we forget how much expertise there is on the front lines to inform development. Terrific. Suresh, what's your key take-home point for the attendees? I think we focus a lot on the technology aspects of it, but the biggest piece is change management. Create a strategy for change management within your organization so that you can truly realize the value of not just AI, any advanced technologies in place, and certainly develop a culture of literacy around AI, planning for those two is gonna be key. Terrific. And maybe one other piece is, or Shauna's comment, I wanna say one more, build partnerships. It's about the scaling aspect is all about partnerships and learning from each other. Terrific, Dr. Overgaard. Agree um, with that as well. The partnership aspect with our Coalition for Health AI, um, there are so many opportunities to bring together multidisciplinary stakeholders. I think the Coalition for Health AI, the Health AI Partnership, um, how can we work together to align on um, some of those very important points? Um, also within an organization, aligning translational and regulatory science through an enterprise approach. I believe that this will promote um, proactive quality culture, safeguard ethical integrity, safety, compliance, and artificial intelligence machine learning, um, as well as fostering organizational growth that we want um, to align our internal governance with our scientific rigor. Thank you, Dr. Bruce. No, thank you very much. And I want to say thank you very much to all of our attendees for uh, all of their excellent questions. I want to maybe just, you know, our panel put together four take home points I want to just touch on that they wanted to leave you with in addition to the wonderful ones they, they just shared with us now. One is early and ongoing evaluation. Implement early evaluation of AI technologies, followed by continuous monitoring. This ensures that AI solutions are appropriate, cost effective, and adaptable to evolving clinical needs. Making evaluation a constant part of the AI lifecycle enhances the reliability and utility in clinical settings. Two, rapid iteration and interdisciplinary collaboration. Encourage quick testing and development of AI products with in this interdisciplinary teams. This approach speeds up innovation and integrates evaluation and governance, aligning AI development with clinical and regulatory demands. 
Third, aligning translational and regulatory science. Combine translational science with the regulatory frameworks to foster a quality culture from the start. This alignment ensures AI applications ethical integrity, safety and compliance, promoting organizational growth and rigorous governance. And lastly, empower your organization. Equip your organization to understand and implement AI principles. Training in AI quality, safety and ethics enables better oversight of AI technologies, ensuring they meet clinical standards and ethical norms. These focused steps can help close the gap between AI research and its practical clinical application, maximizing the benefits for our patients and healthcare systems. Dr. Overgaard, you put this together. I'll leave you to make closing comments. Thank you so much, Dr. Bruce, for moderating this in a very conversational fashion. Um, to our audience, we believe that there's enough content here to form a series of um, webinars. And so if um, we'd love to be able to continue this work, getting into more detail on many of the topics that we've covered today. Thank you very much, Dr. Overgaard. Thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you very much to Dr. Reddy, who's actually in Australia. I don't know what time zone it is there, so thank you very much. And thank you very much to the Innovation Exchange team, specifically Jennifer Sullivan and Lisa Norden, for putting this panel together and doing all the, 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 the hard work. And Paul Chapman, who's been working in the background with this, uh, this, this webinar. Thank you, 